gates are open wide we worship you come see what love has done amazing he bought us with his blood our savior the cross is over Psalm 22 says this, it says, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. Um, I think so often it's easy for us to forget about the importance of coming together as a congregation to praise the name of the Lord. Um, that is the reason we were created. We were created to glorify and honor him. Um, and I'm excited to get to be here. Uh, I don't know if we always typically use the word I'm excited to go to church and sing songs, um, but I am excited to be here this morning, and it's good to see you all here. Um, so we're going to continue in worship, and we're going to sing songs of the Lord's faithfulness, of his love for us, um, and we're going to exalt his name together. So let's, let's continue as we do that.
you've done before in greater measure you will do again cause there's no prison wall you can't break through no mountain you can't move all things are possible and there's no broken body you can't raise no soul that you can't save all things are possible the darkest night
stronghold will crumble. I hear the chains hit the ground. Oh, God of revival, pour it out, pour it To breathe the air of heaven Where pain is gone And mercy fills the streets To look upon The one who bled to save me And walk with him For all eternity And there will be a day when all will bow before him. And there will be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face with he who died and rose again. Holy, holy is the Lord. Faith with one voice. 
How I long to breathe the air of heaven Where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets To look upon the one who bled to save me And walk with him for long eternity Attending this HIM conference this weekend has just been amazing. It was an incredible two days. Even though we've been married a long time, there's always room for improvement. Life is just very busy and chaotic. It's really good to give your marriage a tune-up. Paul and Virginia, not only being biblically sound, but also funny, authentic, <laughs> real. You could relate to a lot of the stories that they share. They put it so eloquently, they put it in a way that makes sense. They take very serious subjects and make them really light. Paul is hilarious. It's absolutely hysterical the whole weekend. Like, he's so funny. Virginia's so warm and loving. They're incredible people. They really care. It's a great way to get back to you know why you got married and to understand to get back to the basics of things. We would recommend this to any couple. Hey friends at Calvary, Paul and Virginia Friesen here. We are delighted to be joining you September 24th and 25th for the marriage conference. Uh, coming back to Calvary is just a joy for us. I was licensed in the ministry there. Uh, John Tobey officiated at our wedding. Uh, David and Carrie have partnered with us in family camps at Campus by the Sea over the years. So we are very excited about coming and being with you. And we all recognize that we're coming out of hopefully a pretty difficult season of life. The past 20 months have taken their toll on all of us in a variety of ways. And one of the statistics most alarming to us is the increase in marital discord or challenges to marriage, people who are seeking divorce, etc. And we just want to proclaim the great news of God's continuing design for marriage. So on the 24th and 25th, we'll be dealing with the theme, More Than Conquerors, Winning the Battle for Our Marriages. We would love for you to join us. Looking forward to seeing you then. Good morning. Good morning. My name's Bob, Bob Schrader. Uh, Todd and Dave are both on vacation uh, this week, uh, so I am uh, up here pinch hitting for them because they're gone. Last time I preached was between Christmas and New Year's out in the parking lot, and uh, there were no lights, there were no video, there was no screens. We kind of had sound and we had one camera, so it's different, but it's good to be back here and up front talking about uh, God's kindness and mercy in our lives. I do encourage you to go to the uh, marriage conference. Uh, no matter how good you think your marriage is, you always need to go. I have a colleague who uh, thought he was really good and his marriage was good, and he graded it like a eight or nine out of 10. And he was surprised when his wife graded it a two out of 10 and was thinking of a divorce. So uh, I encourage you to go. It's, uh, it's Friday night, I think, uh, what is it? Seven to nine and Saturday, 8.30 to 12.30. Uh, sign up online, $30 per couple. It's always good just to check in and make sure that together you're communicating and sharing the same reality of how your marriage is going. So uh, today we are going to be talking about how do you create space for God, and we're going to be camping in Ephesians 5, I'll go to little Proverbs 2, but Ephesians 5, 15 through 21. So the question I have for you is how busy is your busy factor? How much are you distracted with life and work and getting by and keeping the house going or projects. How busy are you? Schools and kids, family, because we're all really busy, right? So I've been distracted uh, for the last several years on a large bridge project. And since Todd last week showed us a picture of his bridge that didn't collect, connect, well, it really wasn't his bridge, I thought I'd show a picture of what has been distracting me the last several years. So this is a, a cable stay bridge in Long Beach, and this is how you join a bridge in the middle. Uh, Todd didn't join his bridge in the middle. 
but, but we, we do in real world. Uh, this is an, uh, a structure used to actually combine the two edge girders to do splice plates. And you can see a man there standing on the right. You can see how big, big that is. This is the last floor beam that was placed. Uh, it's a tradition among iron workers. When you place the last piece of steel and popping off a building or a bridge in this, you put a flag and a Christmas tree on it. I don't know where it comes from, but this was the last major piece of structural steel that was placed. And that's about 11 foot deep uh, floor beam, weighs about 70,000 pounds. So this is in the finished uh, product. Uh, looking up the road kind of has a sailboat uh, image. It's looking at it, and this is then a beautiful aerial picture of the grand opening. And for the perspective on this uh, picture is it's a drone over Terminal Island looking towards downtown Long Beach. So you can see the tall buildings there, and you can see uh, the water and a little fireboat there and everything else. So this distracted me for several years as I was the project manager. And the problem with projects is, and work, is it doesn't just take up all of our waking hours, it takes up our sleep hours too. Because I would usually wake up between one and three every night thinking about problems that we had to solve. And that's not just projects, uh, big projects, it's little projects at home. If you are doing plumbing at home, you will be thinking about that 24 seven because you can't solve your plumbing problems. And then you will need to confess your sin as bad words come out of your mouth as you're doing plumbing. Maybe that's just me, and it's not you guys. It's just me. So, um, so, and then kids, and wives, and families, and women work, and then kids' projects, and what you do with that, and family meals, and school, and all that. It takes up all of our time. And a lot of time, uh, at least my wife always wanted to talk to me about issues with the kids when we prayed at night, right before I was going to sleep, about what I needed. She needed my input into the kids. So... So uh, women think a lot and want to talk about kids. And so men, just be available and don't go to sleep on your wife like I did. <laughs> okay. So the question is, and I'll take this picture off so you don't get too distracted on that. <coughs> the question is, do you have any relational or spiritual time left in your life? <coughs> do you have any margins? to actually take a breath and consider God and how you are living. When you come home from work, both men and women, do you have any words left? Do you have any energy left to actually engage in a relationship with your spouse and family? Work, kids, school, kids' sports, projects, both large and small, will always be there. And we only have so much time that we can use each day. Each of us are limited to 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, until leap year, and then we get an extra day and that's when we get caught up. <laughs> so I've been thinking and meditating on how to create space for God in this fast-paced life that we live. How do you get space for God so that you can hear from the Lord, that you can be active, and that you don't get distracted with everything, and all of a sudden wake up 20, 25 years later thinking, what did I do with my life? Was I walking with the Lord? What was I chasing? How do you instill sensitivity to the Holy Spirit in your life so that you can pick up on those nudges from God and act on them? So in July, my wife and I finally took a vacation that we'd planned last year and canceled due to COVID. And we have some dear friends in Croatia that we started a relationship with in 92 when we were doing relief work there during the war. And they're missionaries, so we went to be with them. And it was suffering for Jesus on a beautiful villa in Istria in Croatia for two weeks. And we went to be with them there. And I was, um, I don't know why I'm saying I was surprised, but because I was on vacation and I was getting rest, I could actually be sensitive to what I call those God nudges in my life to actually speak a word of encouragement to them and talk to them about the Lord in their life because they too needed to be refreshed. They've had a very tough go of it uh, in the last eight months with uh, the parents had a fire in their house. There was a big earthquake uh, in Petrina, 6.4 that destroyed a whole bunch of buildings because uh, there was no rebar in those buildings. And, uh, and then they had COVID and then they had health exams. So I was able to actually hear from the Lord and encourage them and talk about God's kindness and mercy and what great redemptive works God has done in their lives. So Paul exhorts us uh, in the book of Ephesians in 5, 15 through 20 on how we are to live life how we are to live wisely, how we are to make the most of our time, and how we're to know Will's God and how to be filled with the Spirit. 
So that's why I wanted to camp here on this because I feel a lot of life that we live uh, is, I don't want to say it's, it's unwise, but we, we have so much temptation to be, let our lives be overtaken by other things and not be intentional how we live. So Ephesians 5, 15 through 20. Look carefully then how you walk. Actually, you know what? Let me stop and pray about this. Lord God, we thank you for your word and we invite your presence here to instruct us and to guide us into all truth. Uh, we desire to learn of your word and if there's wrong thinking in our lives or incorrect living, we ask you to come, convict us of that and draw us to yourself. So we invite your presence, Lord, and make our hearts um, soft and malleable so that they can be used for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So I assume all of you do that perfectly, so I could just end the sermon right now and say, amen, let's go have lunch. But there's a little more to it than that. Paul likes to use the terms, um, when he says, look carefully then how you walk, Paul uses the term walk as a means to describe the choices that you live in life, not as wise, not as uh, unwise, but as wise. Proverbs, the book of Proverbs talks about paths that we take. So Proverbs 2.20, because if you want to talk about wisdom and what is wise and unwise, we've got to look at the wisdom literature, which is Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Psalms. It says, so you will walk in the way of life, good. So you will walk in the way of, uh, way of the, the way, let me start over. So you will walk in the way of the good and keep to the paths of the righteousness, Proverbs 2.20. The next is Proverbs 4.14, do not enter the path of the wicked and do not walk in the way of the evil. Proverbs 4.26, ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. So we actually are to think about how we use our feet and our legs. So I got a difficult question for you. How many of you have walked this last week? Somewhere. You, most all of you have walked, and, unless, unless you didn't, but most all of you did. Now, who told you what leg to put in front of the other? It was you who told you that, right? You decide that. You have no body snatchers here taking over your mind, telling you how to use your legs. And then where did you go? Who decided where you went? Now, for some younger kids, your parents decided where you went, and they were right and you were wrong. <laughs> Just to be clear about that. <laughs> so who decided where you went? Mostly, you decided where you went or where you drove and what path you took and what you did. So verse 15 actually emphasizes when it says, look carefully in how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, it actually tells us that we're to be observant and attentive to how we live. We are to be careful how we walk, and notice that we're not victims or circumstances of our environment. We actually make a decision. We're to be thoughtful and make a decision. We have a choice how we live our lives. Unfortunately, today in the world, and in the media, and from some politicians and educators, you may hear that you are not able to actually think be discerning, and choose to live in a righteous manner. But rather, you're trapped in one way of thinking based on external factors. This is not biblical teaching. Biblical teaching is you have a mind, you have the Spirit of God within you, you're going to make a choice, you're going to decide where you go, and you're going to bear the fruit of those decisions, both the good consequences and the bad consequences. So be careful how you walk then, not as unwise, but as wise. So, Looking at unwise, what, what is unwise living? Uh, we know when we see unwise living, it's usually not us, it's usually the other guy driving on the freeway or in the road, and we'd like to correct that unwise choice that they made. Or it's maybe somebody at work or at school, either our colleague or our boss that is unwise, and we like to correct that, but we usually don't think about ourselves as being unwise, because I bet you the majority of think that you're wise. So who's unwise? So. We go back to scripture and look at what God hates. So there's this great passage, if you want to know what's unwise, Proverbs 6, 6, um, 6, 16 through 19 is a great passage to talk about what is unwise. And it says there's six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. So 
if God hates these things we're doing, they're probably not wise to do, correct? I think it's a pretty good syllogism. If God hates it, don't do it. So what does God hate? Haughty eyes, not hot eyes, haughty eyes. Haughty eyes are those that are proud, and you may know people like that, but those who are proud and think they've done it themselves, there's the pride of life in them, you really can't correct them because they were an expert in one area, they think you should listen to and everybody else, kind of like a celebrity or billionaires, they want to tell you how to live your life, and they take credit for everything. A lying tongue. God hates a lying tongue. Now, we probably don't, I don't want to say we don't mind lying that much, but, but we talk about white lies. At least I talked about that growing up. Oh, this is just a little white lie. God hates all lies. Truth is a big commodity to God because lies lead us astray. And it's the little lies. It's not just a big lie. It's many little lies along the way that get you into trouble and will lead you on a bad path, bad road. So God cares about it. Also, what did Jesus call Satan regarding lies? He called him the father of lies. It's amazing how much God hates lying. And for the young, the young folks in the group, God hates lying. Don't lie. It's really easy to, when you're younger, to just do it, but don't do it. Listen to what Jesus said to the Pharisees in John 8, 44. It's, it's very somber. And he's, a, he's talking back to the Pharisees. He says, you are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So how would you like someone to come up to you if someone said to you, you lied, and you say, I know your father, he's a liar, he's a father of lies. So don't lie. Don't do that. Next, what does God hate? Hands that shed innocent blood. Do not take another life, including the unborn. God hates hands that take innocent bloods. He hates a heart that devises wicked plans. There are those who sit around thinking of what they can do to hurt you or destroy your life or to steal from you. God hates those who devise wicked plans. He hates feet that make haste to run to evil. We've had great examples of this this last year in seeing all the videos of the mobs who would run to looting and beating and hurting people and feet running to evil. If you see evil happening around you, either stand up for righteousness or you get, get away from it. I've had many choices in my life being in the construction industry that my feet had to walk away from evil. And it's usually was we were at, a, at a, a, a retreat and people are wanting to go out and they're wanting to go out and not do good things. And they say, Bob, let's go, let's go. I said, you know what, I'm gonna, yeah, I'll be right there. You, where are you, okay, I'll meet you there. And so they walked that way and instead of me following, what did I do? I turned and walked the other way. So do not make a haste to run to evil. Walk away from it when you know that they're gonna be doing things that are not godly. A false witness who breathes out lies, God hates. This is someone who slanders, someone who starts a rumor, someone who continues to spread a rumor. God hates that. That's unwise living. And finally, the seventh thing that is an abomination to the Lord <coughs> is one who sows discord among, bro- among the brothers. So if you know somebody who is being contentious and stirring up a big argument, you could just turn and say, you know, the Lord hates those who sow discord. But it's amazing because unity is important to God and especially in the body of Christ. Paul has other multiple lists in the New Testament of what we are not to live, how we are not to do. In Galatians uh, 5, the deeds of the flesh, and Colossians 3. But we're going to stay camped in Ephesians 5. And I want to look at Ephesians 5, 3 through 5, and I'll put it up there on the board in a moment. But in our world today, of complete deliberate deception on gender and sexual relations, sexual immorality is a big issue that we should boldly engage as a church. This isn't a new issue to the church. Sexual immorality was a big issue in the first century in the Roman Empire. We always think that our generation is worse than any other that came before, but sexual immorality was worse then. There was, um, there was adultery relationships, men sleeping with slave girls, incest, prostitution, sexual encounters in the local temples temples, so you could grow your crops better, as well as homosexuality. They were all common. 
So when Gentiles became Christians, especially in the Corinthian church, they had to be told to abstain from it and to go away and avoid all sexual immorality. So look at Ephesians 5, 3 through 5. And this is Paul talking in very strong language. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk nor crude joking which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of God. Pretty strong language about how we are to live and what we are to avoid. So first of all, what is sexual immorality? And this is not a popular statement I'm going to make today, but this is biblical truth. Sexual immorality, and by the way, I got a little PG-13 section going just for a couple minutes here to talk about this and others. Sexual immorality is any sexual relationship outside of marriage between a man and a woman. Everything outside of that between anybody else is sexual immorality. That is the biblical truth. And it's not that we're not to have any hint of it and that we're not even to talk about it or to joke about it who partake in sexual activities. And, and I'm guilty of, of making jokes about these things because I work in the construction industry and it's around me. But we're not even to talk about it or joke about it. And there's many Christians, young Christians in our current, genera- in our current generation of young adults who do not think that sexual relations before marriage is a big deal. I've heard uh, one, one young adult say, well, this is just how our generation is. Just what we do, it's how we live our lives. Uh, I'm, um, for many of us who would have got to premarital counseling in the 80s and 90s, and gotten married then, the, the statistics were about maybe 80% of the people of Christians who are getting marriage counseling uh, had not slept together before they got married. Today, it's flipped its head. If you're doing premarital counseling with Christians, you need to assume 80 to 90% of them have slept together before marriage. And you actually need to deal with their sexual history if you're gonna do counseling to make sure that they're not walking into some time bombs there. So it's flipped its head because people just don't take it seriously anymore. But Paul in verse five there, when he says, um, uh, the ESV translated, for you may be sure of this, he actually puts two words about knowledge, to know (coughs) and to have knowledge of. So he's saying, you know and you have knowledge that anybody who partakes in this will not inherit the kingdom of God. He's using very strong language. So don't be deceived. Don't deceive yourself. There is repentance and forgiveness in all sin, and there's repentance and forgiveness for this, but sexual immorality has incredibly bad consequences in our lives and in our bodies. So repent and stop sinning is to have no part of you. Verse 5 also describes uh, one who is covetous. And I don't know if you've ever thought about one who is covetous or an idolater as part of sexual immorality. So what is coveting? Coveting is wanting and looking at something that is not yours. You have no right to. So men, you have no right to look at another woman who's not your wife and want to have sexual relationships with her or to have sexual relations with her. That is coveting. Women, you have no right to do that to either. Each of these are future spouses. Their sexual relationship belongs to their husband and wife when God gives them as husband and wife. It does not belong to anybody else. It is theirs alone. The other thing about covetousness is pornography. And we usually don't talk about pornography in the church because that's out there. Well, the statistics are actually uh, quite amazing. And with, when you, when you uh, lust after someone else, you're committing Coveting, you're, you're coveting that. You're looking at that on screen. Look at the statistics on pornography. 12 to 17-year-olds is the largest group of Internet porn users. 90% of boys and 70% of girls younger than 18 admit to having seen pornography at least once. 32% of teens admit to intentionally seeking out pornographic content online. And this is an amazing one about the, how much it's used. Pornographic sites have more traffic than Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined. There's so much people going to it. 64% of people aged 13 to 24 view pornography at least weekly. 
And this is very sad. 49 first viewed it before they returned 13 years old. So this is, this is pretty much in the church and outside the church. There's not a whole lot of different statistics. And I got all this from a focus on the family, and they have sources there if you want to go look. So parents, please take note. Talk to your kids about pornography. Set up some boundaries for them with your computers and internet and, and so you can know. And check in with them regularly. And the problem with it, <coughs> excuse me, the problem with pornography is that it's a very shame, uh, shame covering sin. So when you view it, you want to back away and you kind of want to hide and not tell anybody about it. And then it just kind of holds you in a tighter grip. The way you get released from sin is you bring it into the light and you confess it, you get accountability, you get counseling, and you talk about it. So parents, don't run from it, engage with it, talk to your kids about it, check in with them, see what they're doing, because it's out there, and it just, it just destroys lives. We are going to pray at the end of the service, and walk through a time of confession together, and we'll also have people up front if you want to come and pray and talk more about this. Or I encourage you to talk, bring it up in your small group if it's something that, that you struggle with. But please talk to someone about it. Do not let this day go by if there's pornography in your life without bringing it to the light and getting forgiveness and talk about it. Another big issue uh, in Paul's list of unwise living in Ephesians is in Ephesians 4, 30 through 31, about anger. A lot of us have anger in our lives, or malice, or bitterness, and we, um, we want to hold on to that anger. And we either have anger towards God, because God didn't answer a prayer that we wanted, or we have anger against others because they've hurt us, and sometimes that anger is, is right and justice because we have been hurt and sinned against by others. But that anger can turn into bitterness, and it stops us from hearing from the Lord. And you need to get forgiveness of that anger. I was talking to a friend lately, and a very mature Christian who prays a lot for other people, and I was asking her about how does she create space in her life for God. And she says, well, I don't really have any right now. And I said, well, why is that? She goes, well, I don't hear from God because he hasn't answered my prayers about my daughter. And so she was harboring resentment towards God. And a lot of us have prodigal kids out there that we are waiting to return to the Lord. And the question is, do we trust that God is good and we can give that issue to the Lord? And so I reminded her at the time of God's prayers and answered prayers. When we get discouraged, and we will, and you can read this in the Psalms and Psalm 77 and others, when you get discouraged and you cry out to the Lord and you don't think the Lord hears you, Stop and remember God's redemptive work in your life, in your family's life, in your church. You didn't, you didn't just show up one day with truth and revelation and be a Christian. God has been working in generations to bring you to this point. It is his grace that has brought you. Stop and remember. That's what the psalmist would do. Another verse I encourage you to look at, we're not going to spend much time on it, but Ephesians 4.26, be angry, do not sin, do not... Let the sun go down on your anger means deal with it. Don't let that anger harbor, especially husbands and wives. That's when you talk to it at 11 o'clock at night. It's the best time to bring it up. <laughs> it's actually better to bring it up earlier. So bring it up then. And, don't, and do not give the opportunity to the devil. That is, don't let Satan take a foothold in your life with anger and bitterness. Okay? So be careful how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. Next, in verse 16, we're to make the best use of time because the days, of evil, the days are evil. How many of you think the days are evil? Yeah, there's not a whole lot good going on when you look at the news and everything going on and how much uh, injustice, injustice is being done and how many lies and deceptions and people fighting for narratives and not wanting truth. So we see people hurting others, holding on to their own rights, and then we see this thing going on in the world that I haven't seen before a whole lot uh, but it's so much out there in social media, it's just a, a complete shaming of people and trying to get you to shut down and not say anything. Those are evil when you shame somebody. So Paul admonishes, admonishes us to make the best use of the time. 
Or literally, what it means in the Greek is to redeem the time, to buy the time, to purchase it back. We only have so much time. So redeem it, purchase it, and use it for good. That's what he's saying. You have a choice how you live. Make the most, best use of your time. Purchase it and use it for good. But what do we do with our time? Well, a lot of us are seduced by the values of the world. I'm including myself in this. So what do you work for? Well, you work for success, maybe money, build up that retirement account. By the way, there is no retirement in the kingdom of God. You all work. If, you, if, you, uh, if you're done working in that job, we have work for you here in the kingdom of God, so come here and work. Uh, we pay very well, so just come. Um, so um, I say that as one who receives that, so it's okay. Um, but we're seduced by that. We're seduced by uh, sports, active buzz on social media, entertainment every weekend. We want to fill our desires and our comforts. Uh, recently, I was up in Napa for a construction event at the Silverado Country Club, and I was talking to a colleague about life. Uh, we worked together in, what, 95 to 98, and we built the toll roads in Orange County, 241 together. And I said, what are you going to do? And I know he's been successful. I said, you got another 10 years or so. What are you going to do with your life? I said, and I'm trying to th get him to think about spiritual things. And I said, you, um, you have plenty of money and houses. You don't need that anymore. He goes, yeah, I have six houses. I don't need any more of those. So... And it just struck me that, this, that his possessions may be owning him more than he's owning his possessions. I don't know how you would take care of six houses, unless you have a property management person, but still. Anyway, so what are you living for? What are the values that you are seeking? John, in 1 John, uh, is very strong about this. He says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life is from the Father, but is not from the world. You cannot love the world and have space for God in your life. What are you giving your life to? What are you giving your desires, your time, your thoughts to? Sadly, when we focus on the desires, there's no room for God, and all of our vision has taken up what we want out of the world. So the question is, when you th wake up at night and think and you can't sleep, what are you thinking about? Are you thinking about your savings? Are you thinking about your work? Are you thinking about family? Are you thinking about the Word of God? What does your mind go to? That should tell you where your treasure is. So what's the antidote? How do we not do this? There's a great little verse in 1 Corinthians 2.12. It says, listen to this. It says, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. The values of the world and what take up our mind of success and work and money and pride and status is all about things that we are seeking after and grasping, and I need to go make this happen, and you have commercials out there where you can have it all and you hear financial planners talk about it, or you get life coaches in business, how do you succeed? How do you take that next step? What is the solution? Know that we might understand the things given freely to us by God. What has God given us that is free? Relationship with him, forgiveness of sins, eternal life, meaning in life, purpose and love. He's given us family, He's given us children who love us. He's given us children who cause us to pray. He is active in our lives. These are all good gifts from the Lord. And when you realize that these are given freely to us by God, why are you striving after all these other issues? God will take care of it. He feeds the sparrows. He will feed us. Now, I'm not saying don't work hard. Don't be financially responsible. Don't live you know, above your means. All that is wise. But it's what is consuming you. The days are evil. Make the best use of our time because the days are evil. Next, he says in verse 17, Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. This sounds pretty simple, right? Don't be foolish. Or in construction lingo, don't be an idiot. How many of you have been idiots this last week? Okay, don't put your hands up. <laughs> don't be an idiot, but know God's will. Husbands, do not say that to your wife when they say, I wonder what God's will is. Don't say, don't be an idiot, know God's will. Well, that's scriptural. It's what scripture says, right? Don't be an idiot, but know God's will. So how do we know God's will? Where do we go to look first for his will? The Bible. 
The Bible is God's revealed will. And if you want to know who God the Father is, what do we look at? We look at Jesus. As, 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 um, as, as Jesus said in John, I think it's 118, he actually is the one who narrates God to us. If you want to know who God is, read the Gospel of John and see what Jesus said about who, John, who God is. Another thing we need to do as far as what we know is God's will, and I commend you today because you're doing it, is you need to attend church and be part of a body of Christ. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. So meeting together is meeting with the assembly. That's church. That's what they would did. So, <coughs> excuse me, it's not just now that where we have an average of committed Christians in church may become uh, two out of every five Sundays, it was happening in the first century. He said, don't give up the habit of meeting together, and he tells you what you're to do and encourage you to meet. But we're to attend church, and we're actually to consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. So I hate to tell you this, but when you come to church and I come to church, it's not about us. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about stirring up one another and coming to specifically encourage and pray for the body to spurn people onto good works. So when you come to church, don't come here just to say, yeah, just to see what happens. Yeah, it was pretty good. I got, that was a nice song, a little loud. I like the other one, too much drums. And the sermon had one good point. No, you're there to be engaged and encouraging and talking to others. It's not about your entertainment. It's about you being part of the body of Christ. That's what we are to do. And that's how you create space in your life for God. Because when you look out from yourself and you look at others and say, what can I do today? Who can I pray for? Who can I encourage? You actually are filled with the Spirit as you do that and speak words to people. So come and make things happen. Don't watch things happen. That's what we like to say, make it happen. Okay? I recently attended a church in Croatia and I, in Rijeka, and, and I was very convicted about my attitude with church. Because, you know, we come here, and let's admit it, this is a nice facility. And the air is much better than the previous building, right? How many of you complained about the air when we met in our garage? It was either too hot or too cold. So I'm in this church in Rijeka with about 85 degrees out and about 80% humidity with no air conditioning, with a fan that's really not blowing on me, and I just got sweat for the whole time. And I'm sitting there, and I'm trying to listen to an interpretation, and I'm thinking, I am such a spoiled American when it comes to church. I want to be taken care of. When you go to church, you're not necessarily taken care of. Now, we try to remove as many distractions as we can through the facility so you can be here and be comfortable and engage. But it's not about us when we go to church. And then one last thing about church. If I may be so bold, and I hope I don't step on too many toes here, but, and this is both for young and old. Be careful what you do with your phones when you come to church. Because I see people, both young and old, checking blogs, checking news, checking fantasy scores, checking Instagram, checking email, all these things. If the phone is a distraction, now we all have Bible apps on the phone. If your phone is a distraction, put the phone down and bring your Bible. When you come here, be present and let God speak to you through the worship and the word of God. So here's the passage where we've been looking through. We've covered verses 16 through 17, and now we're looking at verse 18 uh, through the end about not getting drunk. Just kind of wanted to remind you where we're at in the passage. So, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So debauchery, what is debauchery? We don't use that term a whole lot, but what is debauchery? Debauchery is an utter and senseless waste. It's used to describe a life devoid of virtue and represents a complete waste of time. If you have ever been around drunk people, you know that is the case with them. They are a complete, utter, and senseless waste. And as I said, I'm in the heavy civil construction industry, and, uh, and when you're not drinking and people are a lot of people drinking around you, you just realize how stupid they are and what they say and do and act. And there's this one guy that I've got to be careful of because, again, it's a complete waste and utterless time. 
when people drink, they, they don't, they don't uh, understand their perception of space. And this one guy, and I just have to avoid him at, at re- things I see him at, he gets right up into your face and he talks to you. And as he talks to you, he's loud. And as he's loud, he kind of spits on you as he talks. <laughs> A complete senseless waste, debauchery, drunkenness. Do not get there. But be filled with the Spirit. So I know you showed up on a Sunday morning wanting to have a little exegesis and grammar, so let's look at some grammar right now, right before lunch to keep you awake. Okay, imperative, what is to be filled with? This verb is an an imperative, it's a command. It's like your parents commanding you, go to bed, clean your room, do it. It's a command. So we are to be filled with the Spirit. Next, it's in the present tense. In Greek, when a a verb is in the present tense, it means it's a continuing. It's not just a one-time event. We are to continually be filled with the Spirit. Finally, it's in a passive voice. <coughs> Excuse me, a passive voice. A passive voice. That means you're not the one doing it. God is doing the action. So you cannot fill yourself with the Spirit, but you have God who fills you with the Spirit. So we're commanded then, In this case, with this verse, we're commanded to allow God to fill us with his spirit at all times. That's what we are to do. So what does it look like when you're filled with the spirit, or what are the means? So this is one of the verses, addressing one another. So the grammar works were to be filled with the spirit, and there's four main participles below that saying this is what it looks like, or these are the means to be filled with the spirit. I think it's both the characteristics and the means to do it. So the first is addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So the, the Jews in the New Testament in the synagogue, they would come in and they would speak to one another in hymns and songs and psalms. You say, how would they do that? They're talking about corporate worship. When you meet together here in corporate worship, as you speak to one another in hymns and songs, you are filled with the Spirit. God also then fills you with the Spirit that you can say these things. So address one another. The next one is singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. <coughs> so who, is the, uh, who do we sing to? We sing to the Lord, which is good, because the Bible says make a joyful noise, so that covers me. My wife sings, I make a joyful noise. So we are to make melody to the Lord with our heart. When you look at the history of revival, when you look at the history of revival, when there's a revival or great awakening, usually a whole bunch of music comes from it. During the great awakening of the 1700s, John Wesley wrote over 6,000 hymns. We're coming up on the 50 year anniversary of the Jesus movement. Back in 1971, who was a, so a lot of us remember 1971. But I still remember hearing Christian music come out. I don't know what the first time I heard Larry Norman was. Maybe 1978, 77, second chapter of Acts, Keith Green. Then Maranatha, and all this music came. And today we still have all this music as a result of the Jesus People movement that we now sing up here. We still see it happening. So the Holy Spirit is is always associated with singing. In Muslim countries, what are Christians known as? They're, they are known as those who sing. Singing is of the Spirit of God. It's the means of being filled. And as we sing, God fills us and we sing it back to him. Giving thanks always for everything to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is so wonderful that God is the one that God is the one who puts thanks in our hearts so that we can give thanks back to him to get our eyes off of ourselves. If you want to know of a miserable, discontented person, it is one who is not thankful. When you are thankful, the eyes are off of you and you're on the Lord. That's being filled with the Spirit. And the final characteristic in in the context of the body of Christ is we are to submit one another out of reverence to God. You wouldn't think this is part of being filled with the Spirit, but sometimes you need the Spirit of God to help you submit to somebody else. But we're to come and defer to others. You can think of of Philippians 2, where it says we're to consider others more important than ourselves. Another characteristic of being filled with the Spirit. 
So the question for us then is how do we positively create space for God? And a lot of these you know. I spend a lot of time on what not to do because in my history, in my life, it's usually things that I shouldn't be doing that is uh, truncating or hindering God from me. But what should we be doing? You need to be spending time with the Lord, right? We all know that. Spend the time with the Lord in his word daily. It does not need to be long. It can be five minutes. It can be ten minutes. You can do something in the afternoon, the morning, the evening, whatever works for you. But each day, make a commitment to spend time with the Lord. I also would encourage you to get away and go for walks into nature. Uh, getting away to beautiful scenery and seeing the transcendent creation does wonders for your soul. Next, we are to pray. Again, you know this. Pray in the morning, pray at lunch, pray at night, pray at all times, but make a designated time to pray. My wife and I, uh, for years, in our marriage, we made the commitment early on that we pray, uh, we pray together before we go to bed every night. Praise God. Worship the Lord. Give him praise and thanks each day for his creation, for what he has done for you, for his redemptive acts, for all that is good in the world. Uh, the Psalms uh, say that God is my portion. All that is good in your life comes from the Lord. Give praise and honor to him, because without him there would be nothing good in your life. Serve and encourage the body of Christ. If you want to be filled with the Spirit, and you want to have space for God, get involved and serve. There is nothing better for your heart than to serve, whether it's in a small group, whether it's here, but as you serve and use your spiritual gifts, you are aware of God's presence. And the amazing thing in my life is that there's a, there's a big thing on sanctification and going off and being with God, and those times are good. But usually when God deals with issues in my life, it's when I'm serving the body of Christ. He deals with it at the same time. So get involved and serve. Have Purposefully have spiritual conversations. Talk to people about how they became a Christian. Talk to them about how they've been forgiven. Talk to them, ask them, how do, how do you create space in your life for God? I've had amazing conversations the last four to six weeks just asking people this question when we were together. How do you create space for God? And then we would talk about the kindness of the Lord in our lives. That's how you do it. So I'm going to ask the band to come forward, and I, they're going to play a little background while we kind of walk through a time of prayer together, because I may have opened up um, some issues here. I'm talking about immorality, pornography, and what we're not to do, and I want to give us some time uh, with the Lord to, um, to go before him and confess that to him, and some time also to commit to the Lord. So... Join me in prayer together. Lord, we really thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that you desire for us to be holy and that you have made us holy because of Jesus Christ. We thank you that we are your children, not your servants, and that you've given us your spirit already. And in the very core of our hearts, the spirit cries out, Abba, Father, because we are dearly beloved to you, that we are your children and you love us. And your spirit constantly testifies that that is who we are. We thank you that you've given us your spirit as a down payment of our co-inheritance with Christ, and you've sealed us in that for the day of redemption. We thank you, Lord, that you forgive. So, Lord, we take this time now to come to you and to intentionally bring things before you and leave them with you, to leave our sin with you and walk away forgiven. So, Lord, we ask you to come and to search our hearts and our thoughts for any actions or search our heart for thoughts and actions that are not in accordance to your will. If you are proud and take credit for all of your accomplishments, spend some time now confessing your pride to the Lord. If you have been lying and slandering others or spreading rumors, 
stop and confess this to the Lord. If you have such a high view of your spirituality and low view of God and think that there is no sin in your life, confess this presumption to God and ask him to reveal his holiness to you. If you have been or are involved in sexual immoral, immoral relationships, take this to the Lord and lay it at the cross and ask for forgiveness. If you are viewing pornography, confess the sin of lustful thoughts and covetousness. God already knows that you are struggling with this. So just agree with God that it's sin and ask him to forgive you. If you're experiencing anger at God or others, give this anger to the Lord and ask him to forgive you. If you need justice because of the acts of others, give this to the Lord and ask him to bring it about and ask the Lord to replace the anger with his love. If you are living your life for the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes of the pride of life, money, power, status, success, confess to the Lord your love of the things in the world. Confess that you've been caught up in pursuing worldly success and not a relationship with the Lord. If you have been lacking in your commitment to the church and corporate worship, confess to the Lord that you have not been diligent in keeping the Sabbath and resting and worshiping and making it his day. Finally, confess anything else that the Lord brings to mind. God wants to forgive us and remove the burden of guilt and shame. 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, you are not surprised by our sin. It is, for your, it is for our sin, Lord, that you sent your only son, Jesus, to die on the cross and rise again to pay the penalty for our sins. The very sins we're confessing today, Lord, you paid for the price 2,000 years ago so that we may have fellowship with you. We thank you that you are a God of grace, mercy, and forgiveness. We give you all of our sins and ask for your forgiveness. now, Lord, we ask humbly that you would send your spirit and fill us with the Holy Spirit. There is nothing more we desire than your presence in our lives. We know that we have filled our lives with other things that are not you, but now we ask that you fill us with your Holy Spirit. Wash over us with your cleansing and forgiveness. Give us your peace and joy. Give us songs to sing so that we can praise your great works. And Lord, remind us of the great salvation and redemption that you've already completed in our lives. Show us your goodness and mercy so that we can rest in you. There is no other place we would rather be than with your people, in your presence, worshiping you. Amen. And now, Lord, we as a body of Christ, we commit to you to create space so that we can hear from you in our lives. We commit, Lord, that we will spend time with you 
We commit, Lord, that we will pray regularly. We commit, Lord, that we will praise God and give thanks for your great works and for who you are. We commit, Lord, that we will serve and encourage the body of Christ. And finally, Lord, we commit that we will not keep this good news to ourselves, but we will tell others of the life-changing forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ, the one and only true God, the way, the truth, and the life. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing this last song?
don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Thank you so much for the chance that we have to come together as the body of Christ um, and to declare your power in our lives. We know that you are all powerful. We know that you are sovereign and we know that you are aware of the sin that's in our lives. You are aware of the things that we don't typically think of as people being aware of. Um, so, Lord, we want to submit those things to you. We ask that you would be at work in us through your spirit that you would be at work in us in those areas that we need strengthening and we need um, to confess our sin and we need your help in doing that. And then, Lord, we also ask that you would be working through us in the lives of the people around us, in the lives of people in this body of Christ um, here at this church. So, Lord, we thank you for the chance to gather and to sing praises to you, to exalt your name um, and to confess our sins to you ultimately since you are our Savior and Lord. So, God, I lift all these things up to you, and we pray in your name. Amen. Thank you so much for being here. Um, if you would like to have prayer, there are going to be a couple of people at the front of the stage here um, during the next couple of minutes. Um, and that would be a great time for you to come forward um, and, and be able to have someone to walk through maybe some issues that are going on in your life or pray with you. Um, so we would love for you to come forward if uh, if if the spirit has been moving in that way in your life. If not, thank you so much for being here, um, and we look forward to seeing you all next week. All along, I was searching for